Lotego. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ferret64 with me, your host, Yemi the Ferret. I hope everyone's doing really good this past week, or even amazing this past week, or this weekend, whatever whatever day you're listening to this. I hope you're having a great day. Ferret64 is, of course, the podcast about video game news, occurrences, first impressions, reviews, and so much more. And uh, we got a pretty nice episode for you today. I'm predicting a pretty good one here. We got to go over the Game Awards. We got some nice news topics. I've been playing some more games. And the year is wrapping up. The year is um, getting close to the end. If you don't recall from last episode, or maybe you missed the last episode, the nomination form for the Ferret Awards, the third annual Ferret Awards, uh, is available right now. If you go to the, the um, description of the last podcast, or if you head over to the Discord, there's a section for it. Uh, you can open up the Google Doc to vote, or I'm sorry, to nominate games for the vote. Uh, that lasts until the 23rd of December, so you got some time, but it's always good to get a head start on it, because you never know what someone else is going to nominate, and maybe it will overshadow yours or whatever. Um, also, the competition, the contest, I should say, for my top 10 games list that we do every year is coming up. That'll start on the 18th. You can submit your top 10 list guesses and game of the year guesses, and there are some fabulous prizes to be had. I will talk more about that uh, when it gets closer. Probably next episode I'll talk more about that uh, for the people who aren't in the Discord 24-7 but like listening to the podcast. Also, if you want to join the Discord, it's down. the link is down in the description below of my podcast. Um, it's a nice community. We have a lot of fun. We talk about video games and stuff like that. Also, um, you, you can just hang out with a group of cool people. It's uh, it, it's the world is your oyster. <laughs> okay, let's get started with today's episode, and we're going to dive into the Game Awards first. So let's get started with um, with the Game Awards. Uh, I guess technically this is a what was announced at that game showcase, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that uh, musical jingle for that. Let's go ahead and go through all the games that won, um, all the categories here. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to start all the way at the bottom where, like, the eSports stuff is, because who really cares? I will say I had a pretty good year for predictions. I got 18, 18 games guessed correctly, so that's, th I mean, that's not too bad, you know? That's not too bad at all. Um... Oh, I guess I guess the esports categories aren't at the bottom. We had some other ones before that. So the player's voice. Uh, so this was 100% voted by fans. The games in the list were Legend of Zelda, uh, Spider-Man 2, Genshin Impact, Cyberpunk, Phantom, Phantom Liberty, and Baldur's Gate 3. And uh, Baldur's Gate uh, ended up winning. So there you go. Best adaptation for you know TV, movies, comics, and more. Uh, the Last of Us one, I thought that was a huge W, especially because I wasn't like super crazy about the Mario Bros. movie. I mean, I, I liked it, but it wasn't like crazy good. And the other stuff on there, I mean, I didn't really watch, so I had no opinions on, but uh, I'm glad that The Last of Us won. Most anticipated game coming up. Uh, yeah, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is, of course, going to win this one, and it did. Uh, even though I think two uh, or three other games overshadow Rebirth for me personally, um, I, I kind of figured that if there's a Final Fantasy game on the list, it's probably going to win. So there you go. All right, we're into the esports category. Uh, best esports team was JD Gaming. Best esports game was Valorant. Best esports event was the League of Legends World Championship. Best esports coach is Potter, whoever that is, and best esports athlete is Faker, which I believe he won last year as well. Content creator of the year goes to Iron Mouse. I'm not sure who it is, but uh, they are a VTuber, so I kind of should have known that that uh, the VTuber with the anime voice would probably win that one. No hate, no hate, obviously, um, but I do think that. 
the one thing that the Game Wars gets wrong is the fact that they don't have YouTubers on here, like content creator. Like this, this, this should be an encompassing thing of Twitch twi uh, and, and YouTube, and maybe even you know Twitter or whatever. Like all different aspects of it, because there are so many people who should be nominated for this award every single year. I mean, Scott the Wah has never been nominated for this for this award. Doug, Doug, um, Wario sixty four. Like there's so many, there's so many people who are in other realms of content creation. It does make me a bit annoyed that they don't put youtubers in there like where's where's beat em ups where's arlo where's scott the waz where's you know whoever it, it just doesn't make any sense that they continuously don't nominate you know youtubers or people who actually who create content not just streaming content but they create content like they're all aboard all across the map so it's just it's a bit weird for me to me especially because a lot of the people who i just mentioned they they run like charities they do charity streams they make tons of money for these for these charities especially during the holidays i mean doug doug himself raises so much money for an aquarium that's in washington like it just it doesn't make any sense that they don't get nominated but these people who are streamers who are probably good streamers and they, I, i'm sure they're fine it just it does annoy me that the YouTube space is completely left out, which it doesn't make much sense to me at all. And maybe it's because YouTube, maybe, maybe they figure that Twitch streamers are more popular or have a bigger for a bigger fan bases than YouTubers. I don't know, but whatever. I mean, I guess <clears throat> no, never mind. I'm not even gonna say it. <laughs> I'm not bringing. I'm not opening up the the dream can of worms right now. Uh, best multiplayer game was Baldur's Gate three. Um, this is what's a this was a weird category multiplayer game like I get it we got some co-op in here we got some you know fighter we got whatever Baldur's Gate three doesn't strike me as like a multiplayer game even though I know there's multiplayer stuff in there um, I just I, I feel like they missed out on a couple of multiplayer games that we probably should have seen over Baldur's Gate but I, I that's another win for Baldur's Gate best sim and strategy game this was my this was my oh my god moment. Uh, Pikmin Four won best sim and strategy game, d totally deserved. Let me be clear. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else to say other than that was an amazing, amazing f like fucking moment, and I literally yelled because it was so exciting. <laughs> best sports or racing game, um, Forza won this one forza motorsport i i should have known i put the crew motorfest down on my on my sheet i should have known that forza was gonna win because you know it's it's a big ip it's it's microsoft of course forza is gonna win this one uh best family game of course with the super mario bros wonder i mean you know it's 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 the other the other stuff here was good, but in terms of what game can I play with my family, I think Super Bros. Wonder was the best choice here. Best fighting game went to Street Fighter VI. Deserved. Uh, I didn't get around to finishing the story mode uh, because there was too much grinding in involved at one point. Maybe I'll load it back up and see what I can do, but um, I really liked I liked Street Fighter VI better than Mortal Kombat 1 this year. And I didn't play any of the other games nominated, uh, but I knew that if Mortal Kombat won, won, <laughs> I was gonna be, I was gonna be a bit annoyed. And Street Fighter Six winning is a thumbs up for me. I I thought that Street Fighter Six in general was the better experience. <clears throat> Best RPG, of course, went to Baldur's Gate Three. Um, <clears throat> there's really no other, there's really no getting around it. Baldur's Gate Three is the most RPG game ever. So there you go. Best action adventure game went the Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting it to win best action adventure game, but I guess if there's a category that it deserves to win, I guess it's this one. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's it. That's it. That's I don't have anything else to say about that. Best action game went to Armor Core Six. I would have loved to see them throw a bone to Dead Island Two, seeing as that game's combat is really good in my opinion. Um, but, I mean, you know, Armor Core 6, it does have great combat as well. It's unfortunate that I got stuck at a section and never went back to it because I was actually having a lot of fun with it. But, um, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, I, I, I'm, pro I'm probably not going to get back to it this year. 
innovation and accessibility with the Forza. This is a category I'm not too like knowledgeable in, but um, congratulations to them. Best VR AR game went to Resident Evil Village, as I predicted. Um, it, Resident Evil Village and most of the Resident Evil VR games are very, very well done. And it, it really does just put you first-person perspective into each situation. And Resident Evil Village was a great, a great game for the VR support because it was already in first-person one. So they didn't really need to recode too much. But uh, it also makes the experience a lot more spooky i would say like when when you're playing first person mode and you're just using a controller it's not that bad it's not that spooky but um you get to some sections with the vr headset on and it's it just the intensity is doubled so i think it definitely deserves winning vr game of the year um best community support with the Baldur's gate 3 i was really thinking that this was going to go to no man's sky or cyberpunk but you know Baldur's gate throw them another award there doesn't really matter i guess uh best mobile game with the honkai star rail um big titty anime girls of course it's gonna win best debut indie game went to cocoon and i love con- c- 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 i love cocoon okay don't get me wrong i think cocoon's a great game but you had the developers for pizza tower there You had the publisher accept the award for Cocoon, but the developers who actually worked on the game were there for Pizza Tower. We know that Pizza Tower is a great game. Pizza Tower deserved to win this one. Cocoon's great. I love Cocoon. Really great puzzle game. Pizza Tower, though? Come on. Best indie game went to Sea of Stars. I think everyone saw that coming from a mile away. I mean, it's just one of those big, massive uh, JRPG-type games, the old-school turn-based combat. And, uh, yeah, there you go. Best ongoing game with the Cyberpunk. I, f- this, I, yeah, once again, this, this felt like a shoe in the wind because, uh, it's just gotten so much support over the last couple of years and the latest updates and stuff like that are really improving the experience finally, you know? Uh, so I, I kind of figured that Cyberpunk was going to win this one. Games for Impact went to Tachia. I really don't have anything to say other than, Okay, I, I think that's a fine choice. I mean, out of all these games, sure. <laughs> uh, best performance went to Neil Newbone from Baldur's Gate 3. He's the vampire guy, quirky vampire guy, and I should have known. I mean, I voted for Ben Starr, and I wrote down Idris Elba on my predictions sheet, uh, but uh, you should have known that the quirky vampire guy from Baldur's Gate 3 was going to get it. Best audio design went to Hi-Fi Rush. Not a huge fan of this pick for Hi-Fi Rush. If there's any, if there's anything that this 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 game should win, and it's the score and music category, but they gave it the best audio design, which is kind of weird because I feel like Dead Space Remake and Resident Evil Four had better audio design altogether. Um, yeah, I, I think that this should have gone to Dead Space a hundred percent or Resident Evil Four. I would have been fine with either of those two answers, but Hi-Fi Rush. Yeah, it just, it just, I mean, I don't know. I, maybe I need to go back and, and play it again, but I don't remember the audio design being amazing. I remember the soundtrack being amazing, and, you know, I that that's why I think that it should have won Best Score in Music. But what did win Best Score in Music? It went to Final Fantasy XVI, of course, because it's that epic orchestral soundtrack that everyone knows and loves from a Final Fantasy game. I do believe Hi-Fi Rush should have won this one just because it's like, hey, we got Trent Reznor, dude. Like, what are you th- what are you doing here? Uh but Final Fantasy 16 is good. It's got a it's got a great soundtrack, so, you know, there you go. Best art direction with the Alan Wake 2. I mean, look, art direction, I guess it's 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 I guess it's kind of subjective, right? Like best art direction, what does that mean? It mean does it mean like the most realistic graphics does it mean the most interesting graphics does it mean the most colorful graphics does it mean whatever and in this case lies i mean liza p had uh, had like c- comparing liza p to alan wake 2 i think liza p actually looks better than alan wake 2 um there's some sections in alan wake 2 that just like were kind of like shocking to me how bad they looked but everything else like there's a lot of stuff in alan wake 2 that looks really really good don't get me wrong uh, but Liza P all around just is a better looking game in general. And then you uh, take into account that we have Hi-Fi Rush and Super Mario Bros. Wonder on here, both games excelling in art direction. Hi-Fi Rush being like a comic book style with a with very fluid animations. Super Mario Bros. Wonder 
taking that formula of the Super Mario Bros. games and cranking it to 10 and giving it like such visual flair, I think that any three of these games would have been a better pick than Alan Wake 2 here, even though I do like Alan Wake 2's art direction. I think in general, if we're going to pick the game with the best graphics, then it has to go with Liza P, but if we're going to pick the game with the most unique art design or art direction, uh, I definitely would give it the Hi-Fi Rush, and that that's all I'm saying about that. Best narrative went to Alan Wake 2. I, I, yeah, understandable. You know, Alan Wake 2 is all about r the writing process and, like, the horrors of of the Alan Wake universe. So, you know, obvious, obvious there. Uh, best game direction went to Alan Wake 2 as well, uh, which... I, I I'm fine with it. Like I'm not I'm not I, like I'm not I'm not mad. I think that Alan Wake Two did have good game direction for sure. Um, so there you go. And then of course the ultimate game of the year went to Baldur's Gate Three. Um, I mean you know like I said when I was going over the nominations like Baldur's Gate Three, it's just like the game of games, right? And even though I haven't played it, I've heard enough about it. I've watched enough gameplay. I've I've looked at the review scores, and they're pretty much tens and five out of fives um, across the board. It's just it's really hard for me to say like, okay, what other game would deserve to win over Baldur's Gate three from this category? When it's like Baldur's Gate three just has the most positive reviews. Everyone who's played it has said that it's amazing. It has so much. I don't know, cust like player-centered customization, like player-centered pick of what they want to do. And I guess that that really is just, just the game of games. And uh, eventually I'll get around to playing it, uh, but not this year. And that was that. Not too bad. Uh, I think I, agreed with, I agree with most of the picks for the Game Awards. As usual, though, Jeff Cayley didn't let a lot of the nomin... I mean, a lot of the winners get their spotlight... I mean, there were some awards that went by so fast, you know, they, they didn't give a, the award out to, to anyone, right? And um, that's the kind of thing that I don't like about the Game Awards, first off, is the fact that they really don't give the time that these developers deserve or these publishers deserve to accept awards. Like, they just, they do rapid-fire like five awards in a row and they don't give an award out to anyone but the second that nintendo wins for best family game they have doug bowser come up on the stage and accept the award it's just it's so it's so lopsided uh because there's a lot of games and a lot of developers who deserve to go up on stage and thank people and talk about their love for the craft um and that's compounded on the fact that they were playing like oscar wrap it up music and actually a teleprompter during the Tears of the Kingdom acceptance speech said, please wrap it up. <laughs> um, and Jeff Cayley actually came out and was like, hey, I, I understand we, we missed the mark on this one. Um, we, we, the music started playing way too early, so I told my guys to cool it well, well, as we went through. Um, and people are just talking about how lopsided the Game Awards felt because it was a lot of... It's a, I mean, obviously one half of the Game Awards is the new trailers and the world premieres and stuff like that. And, you know, having people come on stage and talk about the next big game that they're, that they're working on. But the other half is the awards. I mean, this is an award ceremony and I get it. You want to, you want to make it the best all around thing ever, but you also need to give the awards section the time it really deserves. And, you know, having people had come on stage and do like a five minute acceptance speech is fine. I think that, of course, Christopher Judges went a bit too long, obviously, but, you know, giving someone like four or five minutes to, to thank people and, and whatever is, should, should be, should be allotted for the schedule, you know? Um, and even though, like, I, a lot of people are saying, like, oh, Kojima was on stage for so long talking about his new game, which I'll get to in a minute, and they told, uh, you know, the people accepting awards for Alan Wake 2 or Tears of the Kingdom to hurry up. Uh, I think that 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 the that the Kojima's thing was a fine length. It's just we need to give the people who, you know, want to you know who are accepting these awards. We're giving out the awards for, you know, for 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 uh, for, for games that came out this year. Like I think that's the more important thing than you know whatever. But yeah, um, it it is a little it's a little unfortunate that they went so heavy into the 
wrap it up type thing. Um, in in the end, I would rather hear four or five minute rambling from a game developer thanking people who helped make the journey of completing their game a uh, reality than not, you know. And I, I like I, like I said, if they were, they they needed to have that balancing act of like, okay, we're gonna allot five minutes for this person's speech, and maybe after the five minutes is up, you start playing the music. But they started playing the music way too soon, almost immediately from the start. Um, so, and, and at first it was like, oh, is this a joke? Because Christopher Judge is on stage and they start playing the music and he's like, all right, all right, all right, right? And um, then the person who won the Best Actor or Actress Award, the Best Performance, went up on stage and they were talking for like 30 seconds and the music started playing again. And I was like, is this supposed to be a joke or what? And then the next people came up to accept their award and the music started playing really quickly. And I was like, okay, this is definitely not a, a joke. This is something that they've implemented this year, which is the really, I mean, really, that's the only thing that I would say is super negative about this, this the Game Awards this year. Last year was just kind of like a dull and mundane Game Awards show. Um, and this year, like, it was actually a really good show. Like, they had a lot of great uh, world premieres and, and games that are coming. Even the pre-show had some really exciting things attached to it. And it was just, like, one of those things is like, okay, it, it was a great show, probably the best one so far, A+. Plus. But why are we playing that music? Why are we playing that music after someone's on stage for one minute? I don't know. It's just like that old Green Day meme where, he, where Billy Joel is... Uh, Billy, Billy Joel, Billy Joe, Billy, who, <laughs> whatever, the Green Day lead singer, he's like, one fucking minute, <laughs> you know, it's, they just let him, they're on stage for one fucking minute. Also, uh, when Christopher Judge was introducing the best performance, um, he was joking about, you know, his acceptance speech from last year and how long it was, and he took a stab at Modern Warfare 3 and how short the game is. Um, he said, and I quote, fun fact, my speech was actually longer than this year's Call of Duty campaign, which got plenty of laughs from the audience and people streaming and stuff like that. Um, of course, as anything, as any jab at uh, any developer or or game, there's going to be some um, there's going to be some <laughs> some criticism on it. Um, Sledgehammer Games' Darcy Sandal said. Honestly, as Call of Duty developers, we're, we've heard way worse, but we don't expect it from a peer. And an event that's supposed to be celebrating this year's achievements in gaming, especially with all the information that was leaked about its development. So she's just talking about how uh, the team was crunched. Sledgehammer had like nine months to make the game. Um, so plus, I, I mean, OK, I mean, I get it. Christopher Judge is a peer, but, you know, it, it's a it's a it's a pretty light stab, all things considered. Um. The other thing is uh, there's some cope going on as well. Uh, one of the Infinity Ward employees who now works at Bungie said, uh, "The metrics that Call of Duty absolutely dis- uh, the, in the metrics the Call of Duty absolutely destroys God of War games, probably combined to be honest. So this is equally laughable, if not more, which is just kind of like a petty thing to say. Like, okay, I get it. Like God of War doesn't sell as good as Call of Duty, but God of War has consistently had great games minus like God of War Ascension and you want to say that the like Call of Duty is a year is a, it's a yearly release still and the the quality of the games really is up and down throughout its lifespan. You can you cannot say that every single Call of Duty game is as close to a 10 out of 10 as you can, but God of War games I mean I would say I I think most of the games are 9s or 10s, you know. With a couple dipping, like maybe towards the seven or six, is like a God of War Ascension is definitely like a four out of ten. But that's the thing, like they, the God of War had a problem where it was releasing too many games and they weren't able to keep up the consistency. And then they scaled it back, rebooted the series with God of War from 20, uh, 2016, was it twenty seventeen? Um, and here we are with uh, they. They've kept up a uh, the they kept up the quality and they've been able to really keep it going but call of duty on the other hand you know if something is not going right in the call of duties in call of duty's gameplay or something like that like people hated the jetpacks but we got like five games in a row with jetpacks right well they were already i mean the games are already in development after people start started being annoyed with them so we gotta we gotta keep the jetpacks until you know the one that the next one that's three years out you know it's just one of those things it's like okay you know i get it i get what you're saying but also like shut up <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, let's talk about the the uh, the announcements uh, from the Game Awards. First off, Joseph Forez's first critically acclaimed game, Brothers: A Tale of Two Sons, is getting a remake. Uh, the graphics look pretty good. Um, I know that Brothers: A Tale of Two Sons was more of like a uh, proof of concept at the time, but um, it's definitely gone down in history as one of people's favorites uh, in in the co-op genre. Uh, that'll be back on February 28th, 2024. The original game came out in 2013. The creators of Inscription are making a new game called Pony Island 2 Panda Circus. This looks incredible, as uh, just like Inscription looked incredible. It it's got like um, it's got that style, like the different styles on on top of each other. Like there's 2D, there's some 3D. Uh, it's just it's, it's incredible. It's 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 going to be one of those games once again that you really don't know what's coming up next, and that's what I really loved about Inscription. Why it was one of my favorite games. From the year it came out, and it was my favorite game. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what this is all about. This is coming in 2025 or 2024. It kept flipping between the two, so they don't have a confirmed date yet. Another game called The Rise of the Golden Idol. Uh, this is actually a Netflix game, or it's going to be on Netflix or something like that. Uh, it looks like it's a point-and-click adventure game where you gather clues and whatnot. Uh, seems to be pretty cool. It's actually coming to all systems, including Netflix, so that's kind of interesting. Um, another game called Usual June got a premiere. Uh, th this looks like uh, it kind of has the graphic style of um, it's got it's got like that uh, like low frame rate cartoony vibe. Kind of reminded me of um, oh I just uh, Thirsty Suitors a little bit, but the graphic style is a bit more like like watercolor y. You know, um, I think that I, I like the style. It looks like it's going to be a hack and slash kind of beat 'em up kind of game. Maybe even like a roguelite. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. It's a narrative action game. They're describing it. Another game called Harmonium the Music, the Musical. Harmonium the Musical uh, stars a deaf girl um, that uh, kind of reminds me of the character from uh, Inside, uh, which was like uh, I forget what her name was, Riley or something like that. She has like the same facial structure almost, just a different colored hair. I think the one thing that this game really excels at is like the animations on the signing. Like, she's deaf, obviously, so she's doing sign language. And the people around, like, it just, they did a great job with that. And even though I think that the character, like, the human characters need to be polished up a little bit, there's some uh, some character designs that they showed off through the middle of it that just look so amazing. Like, there's some there's some character design here that, that's really just, like, really well polished and really good. And then, like, she's just standing there and she doesn't look quite as good as these crazy uh crazy designs for these other characters uh this is coming soon uh to netflix and game pass interestingly enough so there you go looks pretty good the, the, and also it's kind of like a, it's got that disney vibe to it there's music playing and stuff like that the dead cells dev revealed their next game called windblown uh this is going to be like a top down almost action roguelike game it's going to be cooperative, so there you go. Uh, the, the um, the the there there was like these these like cartoon cinematics along with it that were super bloody and super gory with these like kind of animal characters. So it's just one of those things that like it looks it looks like pretty cool. It looks like you have like some sort of like motion like super fast motion. It almost reminded me of Fury a little bit, and I'm wondering if it's going to be like a boss rush because that's all they really showed off, but. Then again, you know, um, it's a, uh, you know, it, 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 we don't we really we, we have we haven't really seen a lot about it, but it looks it looks pretty cool from the concept trailer at least. The developer behind Thumper it premiered their new game called Thrasher. So Thumper is like this intense rhythm game that uh, it, it, people people call it a souls like rhythm game I don't know if it's really that but uh, this is just another this is another one uh, this is a uh, the thrasher looks to be more like a VR experience from what I'm seeing like you hold like a baton and you follow this monster around or you make this fo monster uh, eat these it's kind of like snake where he eats like the the, the dots or whatever so uh, we will see what that is all about but it looks pretty cool I was very excited to see something new coming from the thumper guys. 
Next up, Dave the Diver is doing a crossover with Dredge. Um, essentially, the boat from Dredge, along with the merchant who sells you things, uh, says, Hello, the Dave the Diver. And uh, you go into the treacherous waters filled with these crazy beasts. And, like, the cult members come to the sushi bar now. Pretty interesting stuff. Not too bad. Love that idea. That's coming December 15th, so we don't have to wait too long for that. And uh, World of Goo 2 got a trailer. I mean, the last World of Goo game was all the way back in 2008. And um, this new World of Goo game looks to be more of the same, but, like, of course, built upon that original concept. So very excited about this. Uh, World of Goo is like a cult classic type game. And this one looks like it's going to be kind of the same, but also kind of different, obviously, uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, that's coming in 2024 sometime. Uh... People, the people behind the the Persona series has a new RPG on the way called Metaphor Rifantizo. Rifan, ri, rifantiazio. Something like that. Uh, this is going to be an open world action game uh, with that Persona style to it. Um, not much else to say about it, obviously. But, it, I mean, it looks fine you know, from what, I, what we've seen. I think it, it's very stylish. It's got a lot of style to it, which you can always expect from a Persona game. All right, the first big reveal of the Game Awards was Exodus, I believe it's called. Yes, Exodus. Uh, and this is starring Matthew McConaughey. Um, so this game, they didn't really show off too much about it, but it does kind of feel like a, like maybe like a Mass Effect or something like that where it's probably going to be like a third-person action game and you have special abilities and whatnot. Um, Matthew McConaughey's character sacrifices it. He, his, he does a noble sacrifice to stop this alien invasion, but, you know, obviously, it, it, you know, it, he goes, like, the... Well, I guess it's not a noble sacrifice, because he goes, like, into the... He goes into, like, the... It's, it's, it's kind of like Lightyear, if you if you watch that terrible movie, where every time you go into the, 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 into the slipstream, the space stream, uh, you, you, a, you, you don't age, but everyone else is, like, five years, so he goes into the slipstream for, I guess, so long that the people he knows is all gone. It's, like I said, it's, it's just like Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> um, graphically, outside of the cinematics that they showed, it looks great. Um, like I said, it kind of reminds me of Mass Effect because there's like two characters with you, and the abilities are kind of, kind of, kind of reminded me of that. And then there's gunplay as well, so yeah, doesn't look too bad. After Chris judges a time at the awards show, they revealed God of War Ragnarok is getting free DLC, and it is out on the 12th of December. So I'll be talking about this next week. I got to reinstall the game though. Uh, when the gameplay started off, I was like, is that the... Uh... I don't even remember what I said, but uh, it was a dumb idea because as soon as I said that, Kratos entered the fi the picture. And uh, essentially what this is, this is going to be like a... Um... I, I, I'm guessing it's kind of like a roguelike, roguelike mode, um, which is kind of the direction that, that Sony seems to be going with its additions to games, like The Last of Us Part Two Remastered is getting a roguelike mode and whatever. Um, so essentially what this is, uh, you know, you get your weapons and you get ar better armor and stuff and you got to beat bosses and groups of enemies. So should be pretty cool. Um, that's like I said, that's coming December 12th. Uh, always love to see new content, especially new free content for games that have been out for a little while. The people behind Untitled Goose Game, House House, is creating a new game. And this is coming, I believe, uh, in 2025. So we got a little bit of time. But this game is called Big Walk. And this is the one of the most interesting games that was shown off at the Game Awards. It's like these little bubble people, and they're walking in like this super photorealistic world, and they got to get to these cartoony monuments or whatever. It's just a very bizarre looking game, but it's definitely one of those games that like, okay, this is definitely a, something different in the gaming universe, and I'm all there for it. So can't wait to can't wait to see more about that. That's coming in 2025. Uh, Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, that's coming soon, January 11th. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a demo coming January 11th, and the actual game's released on the 18th. So you'll be able to check out the game, try out the game before it comes out, see if you like it. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I think that this game has already sold me in multiple ways. Yeah, it, just, it looks really good. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it is definitely more of like a... It's a Metroidvania, which, which obviously this like the other Prince of Persia games are are kind of like tied to that, but they also have other things with them. But this one seems to be more of like a pure Metroidvania, kind of in the same vein as Metroid Dread, almost in my opinion. 
maybe like a hardcore Metroidvania, but uh, we'll wait and see. I think that this looks really good. We've seen plenty of trailers for it, so I don't know why I'm taking so long on this one. <laughs> um, Senua's Saga Hellblade 2 had a trailer and also a performance by Heil Hung, who is like a folk metal band. Um, they're really good. Check them out if you haven't yet. Um, it's definitely a, uh, not the not your usual folk metal. It's, it's definitely more folk than metal. Um, but they're doing a song or maybe the soundtrack for Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. Uh, but the trailer looks... I mean, the trailer looked really good. This is the first time we've seen Senua's, Sac- uh, Sa- Senua's Saga for quite some time. Um, so it's very interesting to see how this game is progressing. Uh, the graphics and visuals look excellent. And uh, the release date... Well, 2024, which is, it's nice and close, but not close. Like, it's obviously, we want to know exactly when it's coming out, but, you know, whatever. Um, but that looks really good. Can't wait to play that. Uh, a game called Kimuri is coming around. This is a, what, a hero brawler or something like that? Teams of three against teams of three, I think, or something. I'm not sure. Uh, it doesn't look amazing, but the, the the CG trailer was pretty good. So there you go. I don't know. The, I think the time of Hero Brawlers are kind of over, but uh, if you're going to try again, I, I mean, at least make it visually distinct, I guess. A game called No Rest for the Wicked premiered, and it's by the same people who did the Ori series, which is, this is a true departure from that. Um, it's, uh, it visually it looks spectacular in the, in the cutscene uh, and the, and the enemy design. Uh, and also visually looks very good in the gameplay aspect. It's like a top down or maybe like a 2.5 D adventure, I guess you could say, where it's like kind of the camera's kind of skewed a little bit. Looks really good though. I, I, I love the visual presentation so far. Um, no rest for the wicked. Um, this is coming March 1st. So you don't have to wait too long for that. looks pretty good. Ain't no rest for the wicked. All right, so here was something very exciting. Um, Sega announced like nine or five or nine, like some, five games plus more uh, that are going to be coming back. And uh, I don't know if these are just remasters, remakes, or something new in the series. I mean, we saw snippets of some gameplay from these games, and like some of them have something distinct and other ones look like the same. So like Jet Set Radio is is revealed here and it's possible that that's just a remaster or a remake because the gameplay didn't look too different. But then you got a game like Crazy Taxi which seemed to have some different stuff in there. It seemed to be like a maybe like a reboot, I don't know. Uh Streets of Rage, Golden Axe and Shinobi are also are also um shown on here. And more, so we don't even know what's what's truly coming. I'm very excited for for Crazy Taxi. Obviously, Crazy Taxi is a huge, was a huge IP back in the day. I mean, it got multiple games. Not only the arcade game was very was very um, ex- exciting, but the gameplay for the other games was exciting. It's also funny that after Bomb Rush Cyberpunk came out. Uh, Sega's like, oh, you know what? Um, yeah, uh, we do totally have the next Just Set Radio or whatever. <laughs> because <laughs> that game did really well too so very exciting five games revealed in one pretty cool a new dragon ball game you know another year another dragon ball game dragon ball sparking zero was announced um not much for me to say i mean if you like dragon ball and you know and you've played dragon ball games you kind of know what to expect kamiyamiya's multiple characters from the anime uh fighting mechanics that are like the anime, I don't know what else to say. It's it looks fine. Dead by Daylight revealed its spin-off game called The Casting of Frank Stone. Uh, this is, I guess, suppose. I mean, it, it kind of reminded me of like a Telltale game at, at at one point because you know there's a group of four people walking into a cr- a spooky place and they're investigating it and you know this this Frank casting guy is in like a, a scary suit of armor or whatever. And he looks ready to kill somebody. <laughs> um, but who knows what's actually going to be like. I mean, it could still be that Dead by Daylight gameplay we know, but uh, probably not. I guess we'll see. Square Enix announced a new Mana game called Visions of Mana. Um, I don't know when the original Tales of Mana game came out, but it seems to have been long enough that people are very excited for this. So good for them. Visions of Mana, I mean, looks fine. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Here's one that really interested me, again. 
Uh, Rise of Ronin. Uh, this was first revealed at a state of play, but we haven't seen too much about it. And now we actually got some gameplay, got some visuals. So it's got like a grappling hook. It's got some uh, like a wingsuit almost. It's got stealth mechanics, it's got action mechanics, it's got gun mechanics. Uh, all in like that old samurai type style. I think this is going to be a really cool game. I'm very excited for this. And uh, this is coming March 22nd. So we don't have to wait too long. Very excited about that. Of course, Kojima came on stage and talked about his new game called OD. Uh, now, this is com This is actually coming to Microsoft, and Kojima did say that he was working with both Sony, Microsoft, to publish his, his next few games. Uh, so this one is the Microsoft one that, that he's that's helped funding OD. Um, it seems like it's going to be some sort of horror game, possibly. I mean, obviously, Kojima's always pushing the boundary of gameplay and, you know, the visual and gameplay storytelling. Um, the graphics, if these are graphics, are not just real people. It's hard to tell because, goddamn, they look great. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, so it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what this is. Some people are concerned, like, oh, it's just going to be another walking simulator, like Death Stranding. Like, first off, Kojima's always doing something different. Like, he's never staying in the same genre for too long. I mean, even back in, like, the Metal Gear Solid days, it's like, yeah, sure, it was very stealth action-oriented, but the games constantly were changing things up. To think that Kojima's just going to do another Death Stranding-type game is not giving Kojima enough credit. And you should feel ashamed. Also, Jordan Peele is collaborating with him on the project, so that's pretty cool. Uh, Jurassic Park Survival was announced. This is like one of the first, I mean, I guess it's not the first, but it's one of the rare first-person Jurassic Park games. We haven't had one since like, God, what was that game called? Jurassic Park, Sur not Survival, um... Whatever. But anyway, Jurassic Park Survival is going to be set after the events of the first movie. You're going to be a person who's stuck in the park, and you got to try and fight and survive. Um, the graphics look really good for the trailer. I'm guessing the graphics themselves in the game are going to look really good, too, and, and they do for the snippets that we see. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like a open world, like, I don't know, open world game, but it looks really good. Really excited about that. No, no, no uh, release date or anything like that yet. But hopefully, it, hopefully it comes soon because I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Jurassic Park is awesome. Black Myth Wukong got a uh, showcase here, and once again, this is another game that I was very interested in when we first saw it. Uh, and this is finally coming out on August 20th. It looks like it's going to be really cool. The trailer had English voice acting, dub, which was not great, but I'm def if I'm going to play this game, I'm definitely going to play it with the Chinese language Mandarin, whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, visually it looks amazing. Uh, they didn't really show too much gameplay other than, like, it does look like a pretty intense Souls-like experience. So, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely excited about this. Looks really good. Uh, Suicide Squad kills the Justice League. Official release date on February 2nd. There was a secret part of last week's episode where I kind of talked about it a little bit because I was in the in the alpha. And if you want to hear my thoughts, go back and watch that or listen to that. Um, I mean, the gameplay looks fine. I mean, that's, that's the thing, though. The gameplay looks fine, but in concept, when you're actually playing, it's like Harley Quinn or Boomerang. It doesn't feel great. But And the fact that it's still coming out so soon tells me that they probably aren't going to fix the problems that I have with the game personally. Which also makes me go like, okay, should I actually even buy the game uh, right off the bat? And I'm probably, I mean, I probably am because it is rock steady and it is bat like a Batman. It does have Batman in it, so I'll probably buy it anyway. But um, I mean, look, uh, for what it's worth, they make the gameplay look fun. After playing it, I'm sure I'm I'm sure it'll be fine. If I mean, you know, if you play King Shark or Deadshot, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, Warframe got another update. Another year, another Warframe update. This is coming December 13th, not too f far from here. Uh, I believe they added a new weapon, um, a new melee weapon, a new gun, I think, some new enemy types. I'm not sure exactly because I'm not super big into Warframe. I'm actually not into it at all. There was a character who kind of looked like Eminem. He had the Eminem hat, but it wasn't Eminem. So, sorry, Callus. 
Uh, but yeah, that's coming December 13th, that update. The person who was Bayek in Assassin's Creed Origins founded his own game studio, and they revealed his first game called Tales of Z- Ken Zera Zao, which looks pretty promising. Um, it's got a distinct visual style, like very colorful backgrounds, and the characters are very colorful. It looks like it's going to be a, some sort of Metroidvania, 2D Metroidvania. Pretty cool. Um, I'm interested to see more about this. Um, this is coming April 23rd, which is, I mean, a lot sooner than I was expecting, but that's that's good. I love that. Uh, a new game called Lost Records Bloom and Rage from Don't Nod, the same people behind Life is Strange. Um, they're do they they're going to be releasing the new game in late 2024. Uh, looks like it's going to be some sort of coming of age story, a uh, group of teenagers in a band, or maybe maybe not teenagers, but uh, late age, like early 20s, late teens, uh, kids are in the middle of some sort of cosmic horror event or something like that. They have a band. <laughs> uh, so Lost Records, Bloom and Rage. Like I said, late 2024, if you want to check that out. Uh, the first Berserker, Kazan, was shown off. Um, once again, Looks like a really interesting graphical style. Uh, looks like it's going to be more third-person Souls-like action. Um, seems pretty cool. Love the visual style. Uh, this is coming sometime. It doesn't have a release date yet, but looks pretty good. Kind of reminds me of Berserker, the comic, like the the the, the uh, manga, which obviously Dark Souls is based off of the manga. But this looks like it's actually trying to replicate some of the visual style of that. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Its theme song was revealed, <laughs> but we also saw stuff in the background as well of different uh, different events and different things taking place, different locations. For what's worth, looks fine. I wasn't a huge. I mean, obviously, as you know, I was not a big fan of the remake, Final Fantasy VII remake, uh, and maybe this is going to be better. I don't know. I will wait to play it though. I'm not going to get it right away. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it looks it looks fine. What do you want me to say? It, it's Final Fantasy. I'm not super big into Final Fantasy. That's a personal problem. I do know that they were teasing. <laughs> they were teasing the death of a major character throughout the whole trailer, which um, are they going to do it or are they not going to do it? I guess that's the real question for Rebirth. Uh, but that's coming February 29th, 2024, if you want to check that out. It's going to be two discs. Apex Legends is crossing over with Final Fantasy as well. One of the characters from Rebirth is coming to the game on January 9th. Uh, so if you want to check that out, boom, bada, bing, looks like Cloud Sword, Buster Sword is going to be in there as well. Uh, Honkai Star Rail got a new thing, I think a new character. Um, yep, there you go. Don't have much to say about that. Skull and Bones <laughs> had a trailer for its release date. Um, there's a beta coming December 15th, and the official release is February 16th. And I've said this multiple times, but every time they show off this game, I get less and less interested in it, even though I'm probably still going to get it anyway. It's one of those things that's like, I don't know. I just I just don't know what to think about this. And this trailer was mostly just cinematics, which is also kind of concerning. Also, they took a page out of um, Sea of Thieves, and they, they have like a ghost character in there. So, yeah, play three days early at the, if you get the premium edition. Don't get the premium edition, folks. Don't don't buy into that. Uh, February 16th, if you want to check that out. Pre-orders are available now. And like I said, there's a beta coming on the 15th of December. Arcane Studio came out on stage. The people behind Deathloop announced that they are creating a Blade game for Blade's 50th anniversary. Uh, this is a huge... This is huge. We haven't really... I don't think we've ever had a Blade game. He's been in games, but we've never really had a Blade game per se. Uh, and this... Uh, they, they showed off like a cinematic trailer um and they just revealed that yep it's blade very excited for that i think this the dishonored slash death loop gameplay will be perfect for this uh, they just need to make the ai a little bit better <laughs> um, but the dishonored style visual style looks great especially for a blade game um and I'm, I'm sure the the combat if it's a first person combat game that would work pretty well too in that style twisted metal 2 season 2 was announced um the the main character, Anthony Mackie, who uh, 
went on stage to present an award. Uh, said that the Twisted Metal TV show was getting a second season. There was no footage shown or anything like that, but uh, the he said the fans wanted it, so we're giving it to you. Twisted Metal Season 2. Now, Twisted Metal was received quite critically, but um, I never watched it myself, so I have no true thoughts about that. Another game, Last Sentinel, was announced. Uh, this is coming from Light, Tencent's Lightspeed LA Studio. Um... I mean, it looks like Ghost Runner, kind of, or Cyberpunk 2077, but in Japan, kind of, kind of thing right there. Um, so I guess we'll see. We'll see what that is. Last Sentinel, just a CG trailer. Nothing, nothing to go, nothing to write home about. The First Descendants has a release window now. <clears throat> um, this is uh, like a. It almost looked like Death Stranding because of the, the way that the world looked. It had like the mossy rocks and stuff like that and the stream and it just kind of looked like death stranding oh but it was a game called the first ascendant very graphically stylish i mean i don't know if stylish is the right word but uh, that's coming summer of 2024 if you want to check that out hoyoverse showed off a new zenless zone zero trailer uh this is the game that had the controversy about the character's breasts being reduced and not having as much j jiggle physics um, uh, so essentially they just showed off, uh, I guess what the game is all about. Um, it's like a co-op fighting game. I think, uh, still lots of big personalities in this game. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is coming in 2024. If you want to check that out, Den of Wolves, which has been the name of several movies at this point. Uh, this is this from coming from the same studio that did GTFO. So you kind of understand what to expect here. It's going to be some sort of like horror thriller kind of game, I guess you could say. Um, looks all right. Uh, they seem to be doing some sort of heist gameplay for it because they also worked on Payday 1 and 2. So I guess we'll wait and see there. Exoborn. This is coming from Shark Mob. It's a new open world extraction shooter. I'm not too interested in this. The CG trailer looked nice. But I'm, I want to wait and see for actual gameplay before I really say anything about it. The Fallout TV show has some new footage, but it didn't really look that new. I mean, it, it, it really did seem like the same stuff we'd already seen before. Um, and the some of the characters came out on stage and talked about it. It really, I mean, it, it says new footage, but it really was the same footage that we already saw. Like, maybe part of the new footage was was the bear eating the steel armor guy. I don't know. It, they, they really didn't seem like anything new there. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was... Th there you go. That That's pretty much it. Uh, Hello Games announced a new game called Light No Fire. This is coming... That obviously, No Man's Sky was a big reveal for the Game Awards back in the day. And, you know, Jeff Cayley pushed it a lot. Uh, but this is a new game coming from the same studio called Light No Fire. Um, essentially, what they described, Sean Murray was on stage. He said it's going to be the first real open world without boundaries. So essentially, they've made this big-ass planet that is ten times the size of Earth or whatever. Um, but uh, it is an Earth, so you will be able to loop around it, I guess. I mean, the concept seems interesting. It's like a crafting open world game. You can play with friends and hopefully they have learned from their past to not over, over, uh, you know, just to, just to, just to, just to deliver on the, the promises that they have, right? That, that's really all we want. Like just, if you're going to say something like it's a, it's an open world multiplayer game, then actually make an open world multiplayer game, you know? Um, so light, no fire, no release date for that, but it should, it's probably coming in the next couple of years. Um, so there you go. Stormgate. Uh, this is an RTS game. Kind of reminded me of, uh, I don't know, League of Legends or something like that. That's pretty much what it is. I think maybe it's not a lane, a lane thing, but it, it's a, it's definitely like a, it's an RTS. So, you know, it's, it's going to come to early access in summer, 2024. Guilty Gear Strive has a new character called El, El felt Valentine Valentine. Uh, Guilty Gear is a uh, strive is a fighting game and, uh, they just add this new character in here. It's a very stylized fighting game. 
Um, so if you want to check that out, there you go. There are also going to be two more uh, characters released in 2024. And she is coming, Elfet, Elfelt is coming December 8th. Final Fantasy 16 is getting DLC. I mean, the game is already big enough. You would think, like, why does it need more content? Well, I don't know. Maybe it just needs a little bit more. <laughs> um, so essentially, the, uh, the, the DLC is called The Rising Tide. It's coming in 2024. Um, I believe this adds several chapters to the base, to the main into the main game. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, if you've already finished the game, I don't think you'll have to go back and replay the game, but um, it might it might be kind of weird. Also, the Rising Tide is was announced as well. Um, that's coming in spring of 2024. Echoes of the Fallen is actually available right now, if you want to try that out. That's actually available right now. So there you go. Uh, the finals got a reveal and also, I mean, I guess not really a reveal, but they revealed that it was available right now, today, the day that I was, that we were watching the Game Awards. Um, this is a first person shooter. Um, yeah, and season one is coming later this month. Probably one of the pe people's biggest reveals was the new Monster Hunter game called Monster Hunter Wilds. Uh, if you know what Monster Hunter is, then you'll know what to expect. Big open... But this one's going to be open world. I guess the other ones are kind of like um, mission-based, I guess you could say. But this one seems like it's actually an open world experience uh, where you battle monsters in the open world space. Um, looks kind of cool, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, I wasn't really into the last Monster Hunter game. So I don't know if I'll be... You know, I don't know if I'll be getting this one. But this doesn't come until 2025, so you got a little bit of time there. And also, uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is out now on Xbox. That was also the, a big reveal. Um, essentially, uh, yeah, you can play the game on Xbox now. Um, and uh, the Deluxe Edition, we already know about that, but that's coming soon as well. Um, so there you go. If you want to play Baldur's Gate on Xbox, you can right now. And that, I believe, was pretty much everything. Um... Oh, shit. Uh, what about the Space Marine? Um, hold on. Well, they, they did not put that in this article. That is annoying. Okay, so Space Marine got a release date trailer. It's coming September 9th, 2024. Pretty excited about that. The first game is good. It's got a lot of promise and potential. Um, this one, the graphics, the graphics are up in the ante. Also, they revealed the Collector's Edition, which comes with a statue of a Space Marine slicing an alien in half. Seems to also come or come with a, a, a steel book and quite possibly an art book as well. So if you want to check that out, uh, that's coming September 9th. The pre-orders, I believe, are available now if you want to check that out. So there we go. Sorry I forgot about that, or this article forgot about it. Luckily, I remembered because I actually watched it. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to what's in the news. And we're starting off with the, G the GTA 6 trailer. Let's jump in. All right, so Grand Theft Auto 6 was revealed. It's coming in 2025. You got to wait a little while. People are kind of annoyed that they have to wait so long, but it's one of those things that's like, yeah, well, that's just kind of how it goes. Uh, from what it looks, <clears throat> looks like this entire trailer is in-game footage. I believe they would have to tell you if it wasn't. And from what we've seen, it looks spectacular. <laughs> um, there are some shots in this trailer that are truly amazing. Like, you, 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 it just, it's just one of those things that's like, oh, my God. Um, there's a lot of references to Florida, like things that happened in Florida. Um, there's there's meme references in the trailer as well. I don't know if they're going to actually make it into the game, but whatever. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for, for a trailer, a teaser trailer, I mean, it looks good. They revealed enough that... You don't have to keep guessing for too long on, like, okay, who's the protagonist, who's the blah, blah, blah. We already know. Uh, we know that uh, there's a female protagonist for the second time in the game's history. Uh, there was a female protagonist in the first or second game, if I remember correctly. Um, so this one is the first, like, three third-person, you know, latest edition that has a female character, which is pretty cool. Um there's, I mean, the, there's plenty of cars revealed, I guess, in the trailer. People love cars. There's, like, a one of those airships or airboats that has, like, the propeller on the back. 
Um, there's, I mean, lots of, I mean, there's lots of characters. I mean, I, I it's, it's hard for me to like really pinpoint ex- exact things about this. I just, in my opinion, it looks pretty good right now. They, they definitely are putting a lot of work into this. As we already know, it's taken so long to get this out. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I, yeah, I think that it's going to be pretty cool pretty cool it's going to be a long wait <laughs> it's definitely going to be a long wait for this but it's going to be worth it in the end i believe um so yeah uh very exciting very exciting indeed if you have not checked it out check it out on i mean it's everywhere on youtube at this point if you haven't seen it and i wish i had more insight because like you know i'm i i mean <laughs> i'm i'm pretty excited for this but i'm not like you know, if, if you want to see, like, a true trailer breakdown or something like that, I'm not the place to do that. <laughs> um, it just – it looks cool. It's in Vice City, which is based in – my it's, it's kind of like Miami, Florida. Um, the graphics look amazing. The the the, the they, they were playing Tom Petty for the trailer soundtrack, which I love Tom Petty. Rest in peace. Um, it's got a lot of references and stuff like that. So we will see – hopefully see more about this game in the near future. But as of right now, we know that it's coming in 2025 – and um, we'll have to wait for other information. That's pretty much, I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. Okay, Alone in the Dark was delayed once more, I guess. Uh, this is now coming in 2024. Uh, they did this to take it away from the, I mean, they first did it to take away from the like crazy schedule of October, November. And now they're doing it again to get away from the January, February slate of games. So, March 20th is the new release date for Alone in the Dark. Um, if you want to check that out, uh, that'll be coming then, um, which is actually, funny enough, that places it in competition with Dragon's Dogma 2. <laughs> so maybe they'll delay the game again. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so Mortal Kombat 1 is getting a new fighter. Uh, they're getting Quan Chi, who is... You know he's 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 got like that Lovecraftian kind of horror to him this time around, and uh, also the character Chameleon are gonna be his, is the new uh, like sidekick character that's coming out. I think that in general his gameplay looks pretty cool. Um, obviously he was already modeled and play and, and playing in the campaign, um, but I don't know if he has the same moves as the campaign or if like they uh, have modified it a little bit. Um, the fatality that he did at the end was pretty cool, too. I, I really like that fatality. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about here is the fact that Homelander, who is going to be the next DLC drop, is not going to be voiced by the same actor who did Homelander in The Boys, which has kind of been pretty controversial. Anthony Starr stated that he will not be voicing the character late, like last week or so. This week, in another response to someone, he said, The ship has flown. Um, so apparently it may, maybe some, maybe there was some falling out between him and the nether realm developers. I don't know. Um, but it's kind of crazy that we've had like JK Simmons for Omni man, <laughs> but we can't get Anthony Starr for Homelander, even though Anthony Starr did the voice for his character model in call of duty, modern warfare two or whatever it was. So it's, it's, it's kind of mysterious why he isn't voicing his own character in, this DLC, I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. There's no obvious answer here. It's just it's one of those things that's like, yeah, it's kind of weird that he wouldn't be voicing his own character. I mean, he's very distinct. His voice is pretty distinct. It's just one of those things that's like it's going to it's gonna feel like Walmart Homelander, I guess, at the end of the day, you know? And people were very excited, like, oh, God, oh my gosh, Anthony Starr has got to be voicing this character, but they won't, or he's not. The other, the other thing, the other criticism I have is they spent so much money to get Megan Fox to voice a character in the original game, and she was terrible, <laughs> right? Like, that's the main, like, fallout of it. Like, I don't, I don't mind Megan Fox personally or whatever, but her voice acting the game was just terrible because she's not a voice actress. She's she's an onstage performance kind of kind of actress. Anthony Starr can do it, you know, just like J.K. Simmons can do it. It doesn't make sense to me that they they threw out so much money for Megan Fox and they won't give any money to Anthony Starr, which is probably where the breakdown happened to do his own character. It's just kind of weird. It is really just kind of weird. So there you go. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3, they showed some stats off. 
uh, about since launch, uh, how many pe- people have done certain things, which is always something cool that I like to, to that I like to look at. We looked at the Star Wars Jedi Survivor numbers uh, back when that was originally getting its numbers boosted. Uh, so let's see. Um, 1.3 million players have completed the game so far, which is pretty good completion percentage. 94% of players created a custom character. Uh, the most, I guess, out of all the uh, different abilities, they put most the most into charisma. Um, in total, players spent 8,196 8, years in the character creator. <laughs> uh, 1.24 million players have been transformed into a sentient cheese wheel, which sounds pretty crazy. Um Origin character selection. Number of origin characters created. Most of them were Gale with 446,799. Uh, so Gale remains the most played origin character in the game, closely followed by Astrarion. So there you go. Uh, Lazel is the least with 228,000. Most people chose the Paladin. Most people chose the Elf race. Um, most people chose the Berserker subclass. 2 million players survived a dinosaur attack. 84 million players have fireball. 84 million fireballs have been thrown by players. <laughs> um, 48.5 million people have uh, million people have scratched the pet, their pet. Uh, 113, 100, and, I'm sorry, 113 million corpses have been launched with the Necromancer class. <laughs> Uh, Shadow Heart is the most popular romantic interest. 51.3% of players reached the final act of her romance arc, followed by Karlach and Le- Lazel. Is there any more? Yes, there is. 14.4 million characters have been disintegrated into a pile of gray dust. 1.2 million characters have been compelled to dance against their will. Uh, given the option, 66% of players request that Halzen bear all, not bear all. Not sure what that means. Uh, by Act 2, 30.4% of players have given their illithid side and, re- and flexed their powers. Uh, 452,556,984 hours of playtime, over 51,662 years in total. 158,000 playthroughs were started in honor mode. Over 34,000 players died in honor mode. 464 parties have already completed the game in honor mode. And I think that's it. I think honor mode is like the hor- hardcore mode, I think, right? But I, I, it's just it's just cool. It's just, it is cool just to, just to go over that kind of stuff. I love that kind of shit. It's, it's, it interests me a lot. So, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. New Game Plus is coming to Assassin's Creed Mirage next week. Um, permadeath mode is coming in 2024. Uh, so the New Game Plus for Assassin's Creed Mirage is coming. You'll dive back into Basim's story uh, with your current progression and new rewards. Um, they're still working on a permadeath mode, which will release in early 2024 if you want to check that out. Um, in addition to permadeath mode, Assassin's Creed Mirage... Uh, no, wait, I read that wrong. Never mind. Uh, so permadeath mode is coming, but the New Game Plus is coming soon, I guess you could say. So Sea of Thieves is obviously known for its multiplayer and its co-op. There is a new mode called Safer Seas. Uh, you'll no longer need to play with strangers if you're a solo player or uh, vice versa. If you want to play solo, but you've been playing with friends and stuff like that, you can do that now. Um, in a blurb, it's, uh, they said, Safer Seas is intended to offer a gentle introduction of Sea of Thieves to new players, as well as providing a quieter map for existing players looking to pursue their own solo adventure. If you're hoping to get some peaceful fishing done or complete a few t- tall tales without interference, Safer Seas is the perfect choice. Uh, Safer Seas was released on December 7th, so you can play that right now. Um, Reputation and gold values, high seas 100%, safer seas 30%. So there's a bit of a difference there in the gold values for safer seas. Key features include progressing up to level 40 in all trading companies, earn gold and reputation at a reduced rate, like I said, earn seasonal renown at the same rate as high seas, play through all tall tales solo or with friends, work towards all applicable commendations and achievements, Purchase cosmetic from the Outpost and Sea stores. Invite Xbox Live friends to your session. Uh, key features also include becoming a pirate legend, earning reputation in gold, hourglass faction battles, captain your own ship, sail as part of a guild, sail as a trading company emissary, live events, and more. 
Um, so this is one of those things that's pretty cool, pretty cool addition for um, for the game in general. Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. That is that is the new game. I'm sorry, that's the new Sea of Thieves solo mode that's available now. I'm going to do things a little bit out of order. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to what's coming soon. Okay, World War Z is releasing a new Valley of the Zeke update alongside being launched on Xbox Game Pass. Essentially, this new mode is going to be available at a... I'm sorry... Yeah, it's a it's it's a featuring a new premium campaign and some free DLC items. The premium campaign set in Arizona will cost players an additional ten dollars for the following things: a new zombie enemy type that appears across all episodes called the Juggernaut. It's a special zombie that charges at anything in its path. It'll it, this introduces the new DE fifty heavy pistol secondary weapon and also a large caliber firearm packing tons of destructive power. Unleash an array of thrilling mutators for wildly new experiences in challenge mode and challenge horde mode. Transform the battlefield by arming auto turns with explosive ammo. Call your inner cowboy and make everyone wield repeating rifles and revolvers and more. Uh, for PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC players, the Rome XL map will be available in challenge horde mode, offering a dynamic environment to navigate and conquer. There's also an additional skin pack out the same day. Five dollars if you want to see all the action. Um, you can watch the trailer for that. Uh, so there you go. Pretty cool update for World War Z. It's nice to see that they're still working on this. If you don't recall, last week I said they're adding new games to Atari 50th Anniversary Collection. Well, here they are, and they're already available to play now. All these games are from the 2600 Extra series. Um, Adventure 2, a.k.a. Homebrew 2600, Bowling, Double Dunk 2600, Maze Craze 2600, I'm just, they're all from 2600, uh, Miniature Golf, Met Moto Rodeo, Ad uh, Aqua Venture, Save Mary, Super Football, Return to the Haunted House, C Circus Atari, and Warbirds Lynx. So those are all available in the 50th Anniversary Collection right now. Among Us VR is now available in for PSVR 2. It's a surprise launch. It was shadow dropped on December 5th. So if you've been waiting to play this game in VR but you don't have an Oculus headset, you can now play Among Us VR with the PSVR 2. Available now. Scream at children. Or not. <laughs> um, a game called Open Roads. It's it's an inner uh, this is coming from Annapurna Interactive. Um, this is from the same people who did Gone Home and Tacoma. Uh, this is like a very stylish, like, point-and-click adventure game, I would say, uh, where you pick up cards and postage and stuff. Not postage, po uh, po uh, ba -ba 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 letters and stuff like that. And you explore different areas to learn the story of what happened to something. Um, so this is, this is starring Carrie Russell and... Caitlin De Deaver, um, Kurt, Carrie Russell plays a single mother named Opal, and her daughter is voiced by Caitlin Deaver, Tess. Um, the pair is taking to the open road to track down some long-buried family secrets. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure you check out the trailer on PlayStation's YouTube channel for Open Roads. As Dusk Falls, this was released, uh, I believe, last year for Xbox Game Pass. Uh, this is coming to PlayStation in March. Um, so As Dusk Falls, this is like a telltale interactive type thing. You uh, do plenty of quick time events and such, and you make hard decisions to um, get you through the game. I thought it was fine. I didn't think it was anything super, cr super crazy. I didn't really like the graphical style for the game either. Uh, but uh, the CEO and creative director Caroline Marshall said, We are leveraging the distinct capabilities of the PS5 with haptic feedback to increase the weight of every decision and touchpad controls to make gameplay even more intuitive. Um, so that will be available in spring of 2024. Uh, you can pre-order it now if you so desire. Um, oh, March. 7th of March 2024 is when it's coming out. Not spring. March. Which I guess is in the spring, technically. <laughs> PlayStation Plus Premium is adding Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, Menace next. Um, so this is uh, this is coming from a long line of Disney games coming to this coming to the uh, the service. 
Um, episode one, The Phantom Menace, is the next one. Uh, this came out in 1999. Um, it was... Uh, apparently this was... Okay, so it, it has a Taiwan rating, so it's not super confirmed yet, I guess. But uh, if the track record shows that most games that are rated are are coming to the service, so... Um, yeah, this is like a, uh, what? I don't even, I don't even know what this one is. Uh, I've played, like, the Jedi, the game based on Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maybe this is the Obi-Wan Kenobi game? I don't know, actually. I don't think I've ever played this one. Maybe I'll check it out. Um, so, yeah. If you want to, um, if you want to check that out, uh, I guess that's coming soon. Uh, but we don't know for sure, I guess. Sorry about that. And Nintendo has expanded its Switch Online service with three more titles. Uh, we got Harvest Moon 64, 1080, Snowboarding, and Jet Force Gemini. All three of these games are available now for Nintendo Switch Online members. So a lot of people were just expecting Jet Force Gemini this month, but they've actually released three games. Um, so there you go. Pretty cool. Harvest Moon, uh, if you don't know what that is, is a farming game. Uh, snowboarding, 1080 Snowboarding is a pretty technical uh, snowboarding game. Uh, you can play two-player online if you want to. And Jet Force Gemini is like a, um, what is it, like a third-person game uh, where you, it's like a, I, I don't even, I actually, I've never played it, so. Um, you can pair up with a friend to tackle evil drones in two-player co-op mode. There you go. There's also a supremacy battle mode for four players. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a good haul here. Really like this. Um, I can't wait to see what else they decide to put on the service. Maybe we'll see some Star Wars games next year. That'd be kind of cool. I've been trying to find a, a cheap copy of Battle for Naboo for quite some time. That was one of my childhood games next to Rogue Squadron. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a bit pricey. Anyway, pretty cool that they're adding these things to the, to the service. And they're already available now. There you go. Okay, let's move on to the final review. And today we're reviewing steam world build let's get into it i've had a long history with the steam world series starting all the way back with steam world dig even though i did play the tower defense game it was only a small bit back when i was first getting into the series uh steam world heist was pretty cool but a big departure from steam world build SteamWorld Dig 2 built upon what SteamWorld Dig had, and then SteamWorld Quest was a big departure, again, from the series. And I think the SteamWorld games have done that a lot. They, I, I, every entry is either building upon what was already there or a completely different uh, journey for you to take on. SteamWorld Dig, it's a mining game. You mine down to a sh uh, into a mine shaft, and you try and go as far as you can, and you got to fight some enemies here and there. Uh, SteamWorld Heist is like a turn-based strategy game where you are aiming your guns manually and stuff like that with the characters. SteamWorld Quest is a deck builder where you use cards and energy to pull off certain moves. And SteamWorld Dig 2 is a is a is just more of like a Metroidvania style than than the SteamWorld Dig. And now we have SteamWorld Build, which is another major departure for the SteamWorld series. This is a city management game with with tons of management opportunities, kind of like City Skylines or Sims, Sim City, and it also has a pretty cool uh, mining section to the game as well. This game has a lot of layers to it. You have your base city that you're building, and then you have the mines underneath it where you're mining the precious ores and the scrap and the parts that you need to keep the upper city running smoothly. If you don't know anything about the Steam World series, just know that it is a series built on the like a steampunk aesthetic, but it's it's all robots. It's all robots, um, and these robots in SteamWorld Build are traveling to a site that, and they're being led there by some sort of shifty eyeball guy who's like, "You gotta build a city here," and and there's lots of opportunity here, um, and he's obviously very shifty. Um, so the the main story of the game can be completed in. A couple hours if you know what you're doing. Um, and it's a little bit disappointing in a way because I was hoping for there to be more story, like a, a, a specific story attached to each area you go to, but that's not how it looks 
it just seems to go over the same story beats no matter which area you go to because there's five maps that you can technically play on um i, I think everyone's going to start with the first map with the story attached to it um but there are five maps that you can build cities on and, and do stuff with so in general, the story mode's a bit short, a bit predictable, obviously. Um, I think that they could have done more with that. But in general, it's just a backdrop to what the, the the game is mostly trying to do, and that is be a really good city management game. And I'm not, like, super into city builder games. Like, I played SimCity back in the day when I was, like, 10 years old, and I you know, obviously I didn't know what I was doing, and I just destroyed my talents with, like, meteors and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's not like... Maybe not meteors, tornadoes. That's what it was. So like, I wasn't really, I like, I never really dipped my toe into the city builder aspect of things since then, or maybe not for a long time. Um, but obviously, city building is pretty similar to theme park building. I've been really into Roller Coaster Tycoon lately. Again, like I've always been into Roller Coaster Tycoon, but I replayed the first game all the way through this year, and it was just such, it's just, it's just, it's, just, it's just such a lovely experience and. SteamWorld build came out at the perfect time when I was thinking of starting Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, but I was like, oh, but the SteamWorld build game's coming out, and I really want to play that, and I don't I don't want to play two strategy sim games in a row like that. So I ended up playing SteamWorld build before playing a Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. And SteamWorld build is one of those games that's is maybe not going to get me into the city builder genre, right? But this is a really good game. I, I really have been enjoying myself while playing. I've been playing hours and hours of it. Um, I've implemented strategies that I've learned just through my first city being a total mess. And uh, I was able to beat the campaign for for the first time uh, the other day after uh, I, I, I just abandoned my first city. My first city was so poorly done. The second one, though... I, I, I really went to work and really did a good job with it. So let me explain the core basics of the game here. So you start off with just a, a broken train station that you need to repair eventually. Um, but they want you to, to have build uh, workers and do like the basic stuff. So workers only take two pieces of lumber to build a house for them. So they're, mo they're the most cheapest uh, commodity there. So you build a couple of workers, and then you build a lumber mill and a sawmill, and that's kind of where you start off. You start off with the basics, and the you know every every type of resident in your city or town or whatever uh, it, it needs certain things to make them happy. So in this in the workers' case, it's cactus water, um, service station, general store. That's all they need to be happy. So once you get them at full happiness and you, you you advance enough in the milestones for the game, then you can unlock the engineers. And the engineers, you upgrade the workers' houses to engineers. So um, the engineers, to be happy, they need the general store, cactus water, charcoal, you know. Um, but they also need things on top of that, like the survey station and a bar and um, a, a washing station and stuff like that. And each of these stations require certain things in your city. So in order to get the bar, I'm sorry, in order to get the whiskey for the bar, uh, you need to have a sand sifter building, a bottle making building, and you need to find, um, or you need, to, uh, you need um, something else. And then you can make bottle, the, 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 the whiskey making building. So there's a lot of layers there. You know, you, you start off with, okay, we just need the cactus water and the sifting thing and then okay now we need the bottle making thing and the the main balance of the game is making sure you have enough resources to make the commodities to make your residents happy right and that continues from here because after that you get the aristocrats who are like the bougie type robots and they require a sheriff and a casino and fine dining and um guns <laughs> the description of the gun place is pretty funny it's like ah oh, they love to have these guns just to twirl <laughs> in their hands and then after that you get the scientists you upgrade the bougie people to the scientists and they need a a, a library and a, a a particle accelerator and um and and a bunch of other stuff so it all it all builds on top of each other and managing and creating your and building your city knowing that you're going to need these things is really important and each play each playthrough so far i've done three cities now i, I just started my third one they're, they're kind of playing out the same way the last two because I kind of understand what I need for 
the total happiness and whatever. Um, the thing that really makes each playthrough unique, though, is the mine. And they call it a mine. That's right. You you fix the, the mining station and you go down inside the mine and you have that's where all your precious resources are like gold, rubies, um, iron or scrap parts, Vectron parts, etc. There's so much down in the mines that you need, and it, it's, it's one of those really cool things that's like, okay, really making an effective mine is another really important thing. Like, you start off, you don't have conveyor belts, you don't have bridges, you don't have anything other than miners and prospectors. And you go from there, and you start building from there, and you get engineers, and you get guards, and you get all these different machines to automatically mine things, and you get the conveyor belts to, the, to make sure all the packages get to the, the mine shaft quickly, and... You get these booster pads for your for your dudes, and you get teleporters, and you get weaponry to defend the mine from the invading species down there, and it just all works so well together. And it's one of those things that's like I in, in in any other game that was trying to do something like this, it probably wouldn't work. But because this is Steam World, because this is a certain genre, the mixing, it's just it, it works so well, and it, it definitely. It all just layers on top of each other in just such a good and, and really well done way, and that's what I really like. If it wasn't for the lackluster story, this game probably would be a, a 5 out of 5, in all honesty. But the story is just it's a very weak thing happening in there, and it's also, it's also a very bleak ending as well. Like Almost like they're, they're planning on doing something more with the, with the idea, but... They just released this game, and they didn't release, like, the full-blown experience, or maybe there's going to be an update or something down the road that's going to be expanding on the ending of the game. But, yeah, it's one of those things that just left, it left me a bit disappointed when it did end, and it was just one of those endings that was like, yeah, it's not really that great of an ending either, you know? Um, other than that, each time you complete a a map, you get a special building that gives you unique things uh so the first one you get from beating the first giddy up gulch is this new train station that doubles the speed of the train so it comes to you faster um and it also uh, re replenishes the things you can buy from the train station a lot quicker uh so the rupees in the in the in the uh, mines are limited so you got to be kind of careful what you buy because eventually down the road you're going to run out of rupees you can't you can't trade for rupees for some reason. That was kind of one of the things I was like really hoping <laughs> was you could trade for rupees, but you can't. Uh, you can trade for pretty much anything else. You know, you can trade money for gold or wood for charcoal or whatever. You know, things that you kind of are low on, but you're still producing enough of. So you can get a boost for those things. Like sometimes I'll trade for sheet metal because I'm just using so much of it in the mines that I need that extra like boost of 50 every so often, right? Um, but every so often there's like three specific items that you can get and they help boost production or give your warehouses more storage or they give your amenities more power uh maybe uh you know you can put it on like a general store and make the people more happy or uh give you more money you know the taxing one um so it's a really it's a thing that you really got to pay attention to because it really does help along the way when i originally played through my first town, I wasn't really paying attention to what was being sold in there. I was just getting the things in the mine, and I was like, oh, that's fine. I don't need to buy anything. Also, I was really scrapping for, scraping for money, too. Like, I, I really was poorly optimized at, at all turns. But by the time I realized what I needed to do and how I needed to build my city, I was I did really well in my second town. I mean, I could be playing it right now. You don't even know. <laughs> because you can just kind of let the simulation run sometimes and just go. Uh, before you encounter any enemies in the mines, you can really just let your city build itself and just generate money and 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 items, so that by the time that you do need to start building weapons to defend yourself or whatever, you have enough resources to make sure that you have, can build a proper defense. Um, the one thing that you d do need to pay attention to once the enemies start attacking you is sometimes they can disable traps or, or weapons. Sometimes they can just they can tear down the support beams inside of the mines, which can, which can cause cavens, and that is the main issue. Uh, if you can't just leave the simulation to run when you have a mine shaft that has enemies attacking, because there's so many things that can go wrong, you need to kind of be there. Even though you have engineers who, who repair machines and revive workers for you, it's one of those things. It's like if there is a caven that's coming because they knock down a, a support beam. If, you, if you're away from your computer, you don't know that's going to happen at all. So 
there are some minor touches that you need to do while you're working on the game or working through the game, uh, but you can let it kind of work itself for quite some time. Um, I left uh, and went to like the mall to get some Christmas shopping done this past weekend, and I just kind of let the game run itself uh, for like two or three hours. And when I got back, I had like $2.5 million, and I had all the resources I could ever want. And that's kind of how a lot of these games want you to play them, too. Like, I know it's, I know you're probably, like, wagging your finger at me, like, oh, yeah, maybe that's cheating. It's not really cheating, because I could just do the same thing where I just sit here and stare at it, do its thing. Or I could go and do something productive while it's doing that. I've always liked to build up resources when I'm playing these kind of management games. Even Roller Coaster Tycoon, when I, when I get the, you know, I have enough cash flow and I have enough people... And all I got to do is remember to go back and, and flip the switch for the advertisements every so often. That's it. And I just kind of let, I, you know, when I was playing through Roller Coaster Tycoon, sometimes if I was, if I built a good enough park and I still had like a year or two left to get the objective like completed because you need to do it in three years, just let the baby run. Let it do its thing, you know? A part of a simulation game is allowing the, the parts and bits of the simulation to run. And when you do that, it's just, it's so satisfying to come back and be like, I did such a good job with my city that I left for three hours and I'm net positive, majorly positive, and nothing went wrong. And that's just a good feeling. It really is. So, you know, let's, let's say you do need to build up some money or resources and, you know, you, you, you haven't, you know, you haven't gone far enough into the mines, you know, you got the first area done, but you haven't really, you know, done anything more than that. Let, let the baby run for a little bit. You know, make sure that everything is positive. Like, you need to have green for all of your resources and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, just let the baby run. Let it do its thing, you know? that That's that's part of the fun for the game is coming back and being like, oh, my God, I've, I've built a good system. My game is working. I, I'm, I'm rich. <laughs> so, all in all, it's on Xbox Game Pass. Uh, I think it works really good on PC. Uh, obviously, you can play with a controller if you want to, but... Um, the PC build is perfectly fine. The Xbox Game Pass version is fine. Um, I, I really enjoyed my time, and I'm still enjoying my time. I'm definitely going to work through the rest of the towns to build, and because the, the maps are uh, they're very they're very much full of variety. So, you know, each map does have a different vibe and some different challenges associated with it. Um, just the just the in general, like the second the second town has a lot more curviness to it. It's it's one of those things that's it it, it like. You know, it doesn't have a lot of open areas for you to just kind of build up like a residential area for a certain type of worker. So it's very curvy. It's very well, weird looking map. And I guess that's my main tip. If you are playing on playing this game, you need to make like a worker area and an engineer area and a bougie area and a scientist area. You need to kind of have them all separate. Because if you just start upgrading your workers to engineers and then your engineers to the to the aristocrats you're not you're probably not going to have room to build the things that those separate people need. So if you build a area for workers specifically and an area for engineers specifically and etc, you're probably going to have a better time or an easier time upgrading them to the later classes. So all in all, I'm going to give Steamworld build um I really enjoyed it. And I know it's not for everyone obviously, but I I really enjoyed it myself. God, I'm I'm thinking a 4.5 on this one. It's it it is really good. I I'm really enjoying myself, and maybe that's a part of me just being biased towards the Steam World series. But I think that's a really good city management game. Um, love it to, to love it to bits. So if you want to check it out, I would highly recommend it. Steam World Build, go grab that on Xbox Game Pass. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening to the final review. I'll check you guys next time. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the show, which is what have I been playing this past week? Okay, on top of SteamWorld Build, I've been playing Lord of the Rings Return to Moria with Greedy Waffles. And uh, we had one session with it so far, so it's not like I don't have a lot to say. Um, but essentially what Rise, or I'm sorry, Return to Moria is, it's Minecraft, essentially. It's Minecraft in third person, and you play as dwarves, and you fight orcs or goblins. And for what it's worth, it's it's fun, it's enjoyable. If you like mining games or things like Minecraft, it definitely 
and if you love Lord of the Rings, this will definitely ring your bell. Um, I think that the, the the big part of this game is just like the exploration to start off with, because unlike Minecraft, which starts you off in like a big open area and the sun's out and whatever, you know, you're in Moria and it's really dark and it's kind of spooky. And I, I, I do like the fact that you're, you're exploring these halls of Moria. I don't know how procedurally generated this game truly is. It does seem like it's going to be one of those games that's like it has a lot of like, oh, you can't go this way because the wall's there. Um, but I will say that so far it's been a pretty fun experience building up a, a little uh, workstation, finding some some secret pathways, find the, the, uh, the, the resources you need, um, building some things out uh, you know here and there. Um, and uh, the character customization is pretty fun. Love that. So, and, and, you know, it's it's one of those things that's like, how much can I really say about Return to Moria? Because it really is Minecraft with Lord of the Rings skin for the most part. I haven't really run into anything too different. Like, even the combat, it's very, like, just hit, you know, hit the button and your guy swings his axe. And you can do a charge attack if you hold down the button. Like, it's not really that much different from what you expect from something like Minecraft. And, of course, that's what they were probably going for. They were going for the the Minecraft vibe um, because it's very popular. Uh, but it's also, it, it, you know, it's a Lord of the Rings game. It's got that Lord of the Rings skin on top of it. And I, I, just, I find it pretty entertaining, but not so entertaining that I want to run back to it. Like, I, I, I like it, and I'll play it. Don't get me wrong. Um, it's, just, it's just one of those games that you, you, you kind of... I kind of quickly get a little bit bored with it because it is a lot of just, like, hold down the mouse button to mine, <laughs> and that's it, <laughs> you know. And then eventually you'll need to build another axe or another pickaxe, you know. It's just, it's just one of those things that's like, okay, it's good, it's fine. It, it's, but it's not going to blow your socks off, I don't think. Um, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, like I said, it, it definitely is pretty cool. It's got the same guy who did Gimli voicing his own character in this game. And obviously this this is this takes place in the fourth age. And it's kind of an, it's like, you don't really see too many games in the fourth age for the Lord of the Rings, you know? Um, so that's kind of cool. And plus Gimli being back is awesome. You know, love Gimli. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I don't really have too much to say about it. Sorry about that. I, I don't, I, I, and, and personally, I don't even know if playing more of the game would technically even ha make me have more things to say about it. It's just, it's one of those games that's like, yep, it's Minecraft. And is it fun? Sure. And do I enjoy it? Yeah. But am I really jazzed about it? Eh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've not, I was never really super into Minecraft and building games like this. And, and at least playing with a friend is worth it, I think. You know, it definitely gives the game more spark because you're working with someone. Um, if, if I was playing this solo, I definitely probably would not go back to it, <laughs> honestly. But uh, since I'm playing with a friend, it's much more fun, much more enjoyable to work with someone and get stuff done, you know? So there you go, Return to Moria. And the other game that I've been playing is Watermelon Game. Of course, I already talked about this game, but uh, they added multiplayer to it, which I felt was enough to talk about it again. Um, I, I marked it as complete because I got, like, three watermelons in one game, and I was like, that's kind of the goal of the game, right? Uh, but the multiplayer being added in there is a pretty cool uh, component. You're essentially just playing against someone who is also doing the same thing as you, dropping fruit and trying to make watermelons. And uh, that's pretty much it. The multiplayer isn't like there's no like upgrades to mess around with your you know, you the the person you're playing against. Uh, it's just a, who can get the best score, who can last the longest, pretty much. And which is kind of how Tetris works in general. If you play that co-op, it's just it's just it's just who can last the longest, get the most points, right? So watermelon games kind of the same way where it's like, okay, uh, who can get the most points? Who can get the most combined fruit? Um, so yeah, if you want to check it out, I, it's free to play and it's got a lot of content in it, all things considered. You know, the base game is pretty fun. Once again, it's pretty much just Suica game. We got it at home, right? Uh, but it's for PC. It's free to play. It's got multiplayer added onto it now, which is something that I don't believe Suica game has. So there you go. And I know that Suica means watermelon. It's kind of an oxymoron to say Suica game is just like watermelon game. <laughs> but uh, it's just how the naming convention works, okay? Cut me some fucking slack. In terms of streaming, we're still working on the same stuff we've been working on with Sly with Sly Two, um, but we've also I've also added in Half Life. We're playing through Half Life, which should be done next week, and we're also playing uh, Power Wash Simulator, 
Uh, that came to get, uh, that came to PlayStation Plus, so I've been playing that on PlayStation Plus. Um, I've also been playing it on my own time with with Greedy Waffles too, so it's not just um, just on PlayStation. Uh, but I'm doing like a, a, a fresh playthrough on PlayStation, um, and uh, yeah, it's been fine. And it's one of those it's one of those games that I really wish they had more crossplay stuff allowed in it because right now, as it stands, only two people can play co-op mode together. I'm sorry, career mode together. And if you play with more people, it, you have like the bonus levels and stuff like that. But yeah, it's just one of those things. Like okay. And of course, if you want to play with me, just download the PS4 version, whether it be on your PS4 or PlayStation 5. Download the PS4 version, and um, I will invite you to the game. Uh, first come, first serve, of course. Okay, uh, we're moving on to the final part of the show, which is guess that song. I have a song picked out. you got to tell me the name of the song and the game that it came from. Uh, this one's from a series, so giving me the series will be good enough. Um, but if you, want, if you know the name and the song, the game that it came from... If you know the song name and the series that it came from, let me know either in the Discord, in the Fair 64 Discord section. I'll give you a super reaction if you get it right. Or in the comments on the YouTube video, I will give you a heart and a hearty congratulations in the comments. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to this song, this episode's song, right now. Okay, so if you know that song, let me know. All right, folks, I am happy to give you another Fair 64 episode here. If you want to check out the other things I do, uh, Film Freaks with a Z. We talk about movies. The next episode is about Gremlins. We did a bit of a Christmas episode. Gremlins is technically a Christmas movie. Uh, so if you want to check that out, that'll be available next Friday, or this Friday, I guess I would say. Um, and if you want to check out the last episode, which was about Spinal Tap, this is Spinal Tap. We had a guest on for that. It was a pretty good conversation there. Uh, also, I'm doing a live podcast now called Ferret Cafe, which is totally user-recommended topics and produced by the users, uh, the people in the stream chat. You can do uh, sound commands and stuff like that to to enhance the podcast. Um, it's just a replacement for Fubar Ferret. Uh, this next episode's coming up this Thursday. We got some new topics for you. Might have a might have a guest on if they're available. And, um, yeah, so if you want to check that out, that starts 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to, uh, if you want to check, uh, check that out, I would appreciate that. All right, folks, I am Yemi the Ferret, and, uh, this has been another episode of Ferret City 4. Appreciate you. I will talk at you next week. Bye-bye. The Ferret 64 podcast is owned and edited by Yemi the Ferret. The song Nightshade, used in the intro and outro, is owned by Adhesive Wombat. Small sound clips during the podcast were made by Yemi the Ferret. News sources include NintendoLife.com, PushSquare.com, and PureXbox.com. All opinions video game related are my own. Thank you for listening.